In this video, we're going to get our Kubota diesel-powered Honda inside to move under its own power. And well, that means Jimbo has a bit of work to do because at the moment this car is pretty much just a big paperweight. Who knows, perhaps by the end of the video we can actually get the car to move. So as you can see, we have the little diesel engine mounted in the engine bay of this Honda Insight and in the previous video we somehow managed to custom build a set of axles that will connect this Saturn MP3 transmission to the hubs on this car. Yeah, it's an odd combination of parts for sure, and it should be interesting to see how it all turns out. Now the good news is, the custom axles were the last major hurdle we had to jump on this project. The bad news is, well, once we installed the axles, we discovered the engine and transmission need to be moved forward about 3 8 of an inch. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds. You see, the mounts on this car were built in such a way that they can be modified. Actually, anything can be modified when you think about it, so I guess there's nothing special about the mounts. Well, I take that back. These mounts are special because they're very flexible and we want them to be a bit stiffer. So as you can see, we have a lot of movement in the front engine mounting bracket, and that's because it's kind of flimsy. You know, just because we build something doesn't mean it's built correctly. Now on the back side of the engine, we have the lower mount, and this guy doesn't actually support the engine. Its purpose is to control the torque loads that are developed in the powertrain when the car accelerates. Torque mounts are common on front wheel drive cars, and some cars have more than one. Anyway, our torque mount, well, it's kind of busted. On this mount, we took the shortcut, and instead of fabricating something different, we decided to use an original Honda Insight part. And I'll tell you, these original parts are expensive. This lower mount was 99 bucks. Anyway, replacing this mount will help eliminate some of the flex in the mounting system. So let's get going and solve some problems. The first thing we're going to work on is the front motor mount. And on this mount we have to eliminate the flex and we also have to move the mount towards the front of the car 3 8 of an inch. Now on this mount the flex issue is going to be a bit of a problem. However moving the engine forward is going to be easy. You see all we have to do is modify these spacers and that will allow us to move the engine this way. Now on the flex issue, well that's going to require some thought. I'm thinking that the top of this motor mount brace needs to be anchored to the engine somewhere. Now at first glance there may seem to be plenty of places where we could attach the motor mount bracket to the engine, but unfortunately nothing on the front of this engine is going to be suitable. Well first of all these are all M6 fasteners. You know they may look big on your video screen, but in fact they're very small bolts. Anyway, we need to keep the front of the engine clear to allow for the alternator belt and over on this side of the engine we need to keep this space open because in the near future we'll be fabricating a gizmo of some sort to automatically adjust the fuel rack. Now this rack gizmo is going to be very important for performance and we need all the space we can get. Now I'm totally against using head bolts as an anchor point. These bolts have a purpose already and when we add boost to the engine I want these bolts to do only one thing. So pretty much the whole front of the engine is unsuitable to anchor the motor mount brace because we need to keep the space clear of any clutter. And whatever bolts are available, well, they're too small. We need a good anchor point and I think we're actually looking in the wrong area. So over here on the back side of the transmission bell housing, we have some beefy fasteners available. But they're too far away. Or are they? Let's take a better look. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. It looks like these two bolts on the bell housing will be strong enough to anchor the front motor mount. Of course, we'll have to be a bit creative to make this all work, but that ain't no big deal. Here's the plan. We're going to build a bracket that kind of sort of looks like this, and it attaches to the two bolts on the bell housing. Now, for the rest of the plan, well, we'll figure that out later. So the first thing is to make this bracket. And through the magic of editing, we now have a bracket. So in case you're wondering, this bracket's made from A36 steel, and it's a quarter inch thick, so yeah, it's pretty strong. Let's install the bracket, and then we can figure out how to connect it to the front motor mount. Okay, well the bracket fits perfectly. Now we have to connect it to the front motor mount. From the rear bracket to the front motor mount, it's pretty much a straight shot. But we do have to allow clearance for these two spigots on the cooling system. Okay, so here's the big picture, or plan. We need to attach this bracket to this bracket, like so. For this cross brace, we're going to use a lightweight bar of 6061 aluminum. Seems easy enough, however we're also going to make this brace adjustable, so it does get slightly more complicated. I reckon for this bit of fabrication, we're going to use the lathe.
Now we need to carve some threads into this cross brace. And to do that, we'll get the tap started on the lathe and then we'll finish it off on the bench vise. All right, let's see how this thing fits. Well, shucks. As you can see, the bar falls short of the front mount, but that was actually on purpose. You see, in order to allow clearance for the cooling system spigots, we had to offset the bar slightly. Not a big deal. All we need to do now is make another bracket. And the new bracket should look something like this, I hope. All right, let's see how this new bracket fits. Oh, off camera, I also had to fabricate a tiny spacer on the lathe in order to complete the system. So before we put the last bolt in, let's take another look at how much flex we have. Yep, so we do in fact have a lot of movement. Now let's put the last bolt in and see how much that changes things. I'm sure some of you folks feel that there may have been a better solution for this problem. And I guess that's easy to think from where you're sitting. But like I mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of stuff to consider, like the alternator belt and clearance for this, that, and the other thing. When it comes down to it, this was the simplest solution, and it absolutely won't get in the way of all the other things we have to fabricate. Anyway, let's see if this cross brace makes a difference. Oh yeah, this is tight. And just for giggles, let's take another look at before. Yeah, what a huge difference. So that solves the flexing in the motor mount. Now we have to move the engine forward 3 8 of an inch. And for that, I'm gonna modify these spacers on the lathe and to save time, I'll do that off camera. Okay, so the right side motor mount is finished. Let's take a look at the left side mount. Now on this mount, all we have to do is move it this way. However, that creates a new problem and there will be an interference between the mount and this bolt, which ain't here right now. And as you'll see in a few moments, that's gonna be an easy fix. So in order to work on the mount, we had to put a floor jack under the transmission to support the weight of the drive line. The good news is all this stuff is fairly lightweight and I believe the complete engine and transmission package weighs less than 220 pounds. All right, let's take this bracket off and modify it. So off camera, I drilled the pilot holes for the new transmission mounting holes. And as you can see, if we expand these holes to their proper size, well, we're gonna have some problems. I reckon before we go any further, we need to weld these old holes up. Now to weld these holes, I'm gonna use a copper backer plate. And what the copper does is, it provides a surface to build up my welds on. Now the reason I'm using copper is, the steel filler won't stick to it, even if we weld right on top of it. Okay, fast forward a few minutes and the transmission mount's finished. As you can see, the old holes have been welded up and the new holes have been drilled. So far, so good. Now, in order to solve the interference issue, we went ahead and replaced the 10 millimeter diameter bolt with an eight millimeter diameter bolt. Actually, it's a 5 16 bolt, but 5 16 is more or less the same as eight millimeter when you're in rural Kansas. Anyway, we went with the smaller diameter bolt because it has a smaller head and that allowed us to sink the head of the bolt below the surface of the plate to eliminate any interference. So on the back side of this plate, you can see we just welded another chunk of steel to it. And as luck would have it, this chunk of extra steel causes another problem. 
but all we have to do is trim down the spacer that goes behind this chunk and everything should fit perfectly. Let's see if that's true. So this is the spacer I was talking about earlier. Now adding the chunk of steel to the back of the mounting plate required us to trim a little bit off this spacer and now everything fits perfectly. Well, the rest of the mounting system remains unchanged and I'll deal with putting that back together off camera. So this guy is the anti-torque or torque mount or whatever. This bracket basically keeps the powertrain from twisting when the car accelerates. So when we move the engine forward 3 8 of an inch, it upset the alignment of this bracket. And the funny thing is, the bracket's more than 3 8 of an inch off. It's weird. So normally the bolt wants to go through this hole, but now the bolt wants to go here. And that's kind of awkward because we can't drill a hole there. So the only solution is to cut this bracket and weld in some more steel. So here we have the new steel pieces that we have to splice onto the bracket. I'm using the center section of the old Honda torque mount to set the distance between these two chunks of metal. Hopefully this will give you an idea what I'm talking about. So we're going to have to cut this bracket on the red line and then weld this guy in place and that should fix our alignment issue. Fast forward a few minutes and the torque brace is finished. Now, it ain't pretty, but it's located below the car and not very many people will see it. Well, I take that back. I guess at least 50,000 people will see this bracket. Um, well, I guess I should have made it look nicer. Anyway, the bolt seems to fit, so that's a bonus. Let's see how it fits under the car. Not too shabby. Now, this bracket is actually not finished yet. The basic shape, well, that's finished, but we do have to add a few more reinforcements to it. And maybe we'll make it look nicer, but not today. So the whole reason we're trying to get the car to move under its own power today is to test the clutch. And if you're curious, that's the reason the front left fender has been removed. You see, in order to work on the clutch, it's infinitely easier if the fender's off the car. And that's because the clutch master cylinder is tucked away in the wheel well. You know, I guess it made sense to Honda to build it this way. So we have a couple of things going on here. This is the high pressure hydraulic line. This is the line for the fluid reservoir, and this is the splice point where the steel high pressure line is converted over to a nylon high pressure line that's used on the Saturn clutch system. Now the clutch pedal on this Honda, well, for the most part it feels okay, but it doesn't feel the same as the clutch on our 95 Saturn wagon. And basically the wagon has the same transmission and clutch that we're using on this diesel Honda Insight. So the question is, will the Honda Master Cylinder push enough fluid to release the clutch on the Saturn MP3 transmission? And the short answer is, nope, it won't. But we did get it to work. Well, at least we think we did. So this is the complete hydraulic clutch system used on the Saturn. Now, normally if there's any problems with this system, you have to replace everything as a single unit. Now, what we did was cut the hydraulic line here and got rid of the Saturn Master Cylinder. There's just no way we were going to get that to fit in this location. Anyway, we then connected the Honda Master Cylinder to the circuit, and we couldn't get a decent clutch pedal. Now, it's tough to bleed all the air out of the hydraulic system, because, well, on a Saturn, there's no bleed screw on a slave cylinder. But if you're persistent, there are ways to get the air out. So no matter what we did, we couldn't get a decent clutch pedal. Next, we cut the accumulator, or whatever this thing is, and then connected the Honda Master directly to the Saturn Slave, and at that point, we got a decent clutch pedal. But is it going to be enough to disengage the clutch? I don't know. Let's find out. So it's finally time to take this car for a short drive around the parking lot. Now for this quick drive, well, we're going to use a mini, mini, tiny, ultra small fuel tank. This is probably the smallest tank we've ever used. And of course we also have the electric lift pump plumbed into the fuel circuit. Now there's no cooling system on this car yet, so we can't drive it too far. There ain't an ignition switch yet, so for today we're going to be using the Lone Wolf 2000. Alright, let me power up the fuel pump and we can get this show on the road. To quote Derek from Vice Grip Garage, Bring the thunder!
And, yep, it goes into gear. Now let's try reverse. Oh yeah, the throttle cable isn't connected yet. <laughs> I guess we got a few more things to do. Well, it wasn't much of a first drive, but the car will move and the clutch seems to work fine, which is a big relief. I reckon now we can put the front fender back on the car and let's see what else. Oh yeah, we can get rid of this silly fuel tank and connect the real fuel tank. And of course we need to finish the cooling system, which is just basically connecting the hoses to the radiator. Now for the exhaust, well, that's going to be a bit more tricky. This car is going to be getting a full exhaust with a tailpipe, and that's of course to keep the fumes from getting in the cabin. You know, there's not a lot of room under the car to snake the oversized pipes under the engine and leave room for the belly pan. We'll get there one way or the other. So there's basically a dozen or so parts we had to fabricate to get this engine and transmission package to drop into the little Honda. Now, to connect the Kubota D722 engine to the Saturn transmission, that also required some custom fabrication, and we did all that when we originally put this engine and transmission in a Saturn coupe. Basically, we had to make some quarter-inch thick steel adapter plates and about two dozen aluminum bushings or spacers. Now, the hardest part about this whole swap was modifying the Saturn flywheel to fit the Kubota engine. And for that, we had to send the flywheel out to have these holes CNC drilled, and they also had to add some material here and to do a bit of machining as well. I love doing projects like this, and who knows, this lightweight and aerodynamic car may actually surprise us with its performance, well, as far as speed and fuel economy goes. You know, this is still a small channel, and projects like this are expensive and time-consuming. The most expensive and time-consuming part is actually filming all this stuff. If you haven't subscribed already, now is the time to do so. It's of course free to subscribe, and the way YouTube works, with a large subscriber base, we're able to continue doing unusual projects like this. Now, if you really want to help us out, please share these videos with folks who like this sort of stuff. We are extremely grateful to have you as an audience, and without you, these videos wouldn't be possible. Anyway, I have a whole bunch of stuff to do this week, and I'll see you next time. Until then.